Do North Korea have nukes? Are the Iranians still trying to build a nuclear bomb? Are we perpetually on the brink of thermonuclear war? The governments and the elites that control them have such a history of lying to the public and we not assume we are not being told the truth. From the Titanic to 9-11, the public have been fed one pantomime after another. Can we not be forgiven for questioning nuclear weapons, perhaps their tallest of tales? All this time has passed and still no nuclear war. This is excused with the notion of mutually assured destruction. The idea that all supposedly nuclear armed nations fear their own nuclear destruction too much to try to destroy another. And so we live in perpetual nuclear peace in a world of continuous conventional war. What if all war was a fraud, the banking elite controlling all sides, all playing for a draw, not trying to defeat their enemy, but controlling their populations with fear? Why not forget the weapons and simulate it all on computers? It's bluff, John Coilo. No, it's not a bluff, it's real. Hello, General Barringer, Stephen Falcon. Mr. Falcon, you picked a hell of a day for a visit. Uh, uh, General, what you see on these screens up here is a fantasy, a computer-enhanced hallucination. Those blips are not real missiles, they're phantoms. Jack, there's nothing to indicate a simulation at all. Everything's working perfectly. But does it make any sense? Does what make any sense? Wouldn't it be cheaper and easier to pretend? Why spend all that money on weapons you know you're never going to use? When convincing your enemy or your public you've got them achieves the same ends. want to endanger themselves with nuclear weapons considering what they can supposedly do? Do they want to destroy the world and hide underground in bunkers? Or is that just what they want you to think? They haven't done it yet, and I wouldn't hold your breath. Why have lots of nukes pointed at each other? Why not just have one very big one each, powerful enough to destroy the world? Would it not offer the same protection? If nuclear weapons exist, why do they tell us? Why aren't they kept secret? Surely it would be the best way to prevent them from proliferating. We are so secretive about all their other weapon systems, like harp, directed energy weapons, rail guns and coil guns, and rods of god or kinetic weapons. Real or not, nuclear weapons are weapons of propaganda, designed to fill the public with fear, through which the elites control the population of the world. Neutrons goes into another uranium nucleus, 
and causes fission. Then the first fission has led to more than two fissions in the next generation, and you can see that each successive generation has many more neutrons, and this causes an explosive chain reaction. There are two masses of highly fissionable uranium in the form of a sphere and a plug could be brought together with sufficient speed inside a bomb. An exponentially increasing chain reaction with explosive force would result. It was known that the nucleus of one form of uranium, isotope 235, would split when it absorbed a neutron. When this happened, energy was released and more neutrons were created that struck and split other nuclei. When it happens continuously, it's known as a chain reaction. No one knew at the start how much fissionable material was needed to support an explosive chain reaction. That volume would be known as the critical mass. Another element, only discovered in late 1941 by Berkeley nuclear chemist Glenn Seaborg, also had the properties to explode in a chain reaction. And we immediately saw no one's mind was on anything, but how can this be used for war? It gradually became clear. It's quite possible to make an explosion of this. It was this concern that led refugee German physicist Leo Szilard to reveal that possibility to the U.S. government. Together with Albert Einstein and Edward Teller, he composed a letter to President Franklin Roosevelt. It told of a terrible possibility. Germany had the talent and the knowledge to research and develop an atomic weapon. Delivering the letter to Roosevelt on their behalf was economist Alexander Sachs, a friend of Slizard and economic advisor to the president. Let's take a look at this letter. It may become possible to set up a nuclear chain reaction in a large mass of uranium. This new phenomenon would also lead to the construction of bombs, and it is conceivable, though much less certain, that extremely powerful bombs of a new type may thus be constructed. However, such bombs might very well prove to be too heavy for transportation by air. Major General Leslie R. Groves, the man responsible for the Pentagon, was placed in charge of the project. The project was massive. To design and build a device that existed only in theory, from material that didn't exist in any quantity, under unprecedented secrecy. Fermi tackled the first obstacle to the bomb. The question of whether or not a sustained chain reaction could be induced in a uranium reactor. Without the successively doubling power of the chain reaction, a bomb would be an impossibility. Fermi was one of the few scientists who was talented both in theory and in practice. He loved getting his hands dirty. Leo Szilard was the antithesis of Enrico Fermi. Szilard usually slept late. He soaked in the bathtub to get fresh ideas. While in the bathtub, Szilard remained focused on the competition, the German bomb effort. He convinced scientists in the U.S. whose community thrived on openness to censor their own papers so that they would not inadvertently help the Germans. This would also facilitate the hoax. The nuclear bomb hoax thrives on secrecy, and in fact, one of its main purposes is to create an apparent need for extreme secrecy within the government and the industrial military complex. One of the main purposes for the creation of the myth of nuclear weapons is the rise of the secret services. Nuclear weapons provide a perfect excuse for governments to keep secrets and tell lies to their populations. As a result of the nuclear weapon myth, the population demand it. Without nuclear weapons, there is little or no justification for keeping secrets and telling lies to the population, or for the organizations charged with that task. But sometimes we forget that security violations can be dangerous business too. If classified information about this test mission fell into enemy hands, the consequences could be disastrous to all of us, individually and collectively as a nation. Security is only common sense. Don't take chances. Avoid loose talk. Safeguard classified information. Report security violations at once. Prompt action may prevent a minor incident from developing into a serious one. Avoid writing about classified material in letters home. Be sure you're secure. Don't be careless. I hate a careless man. The U.S. bomb effort was taking its first tentative steps. News that the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin had begun actively pursuing uranium research rippled through the American scientific community. It would take nothing short of a disaster to move the president to take decisive action. And a disaster was not far off. Pearl Harbor plunged the United States into war. 
self-sustaining chain reacting pile was successfully operated by Enrico Fermi. Fermi's success brought intense efforts between government and the private sector, creating huge industries for uranium separation in the town of Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and for the production of plutonium in Hanford, Washington. They were trying to demonstrate that the fission process could be harnessed by launching a sustained chain reaction in uranium. They built the first primitive reactor in a squash court beneath the stands of the university's football stadium. The reactor consisted of a pile in which a fission reaction could be initiated and controlled. They did it by piling layers of graphite and then embedding balls of uranium so that when the neutrons started flying through, they would be slowed by the graphite, collide with the uranium, release more neutrons, and those neutrons would continue in the chain reaction pattern. This momentous achievement, only detectable by a Geiger counter, meant that the fission process could be sustained. Nuclear energy could be released in a controlled way, as in a reactor, or perhaps cataclysmically, as in a bomb. This in no way indicates that an explosive chain reaction is achievable. To head up the installation, Groves, an expert judge of men, chose a most unlikely candidate, J. Robert Oppenheimer. A gifted physics professor, Oppenheimer had a reputation for being temperamental, perhaps not suited to a highly stressful assignment. It was advised that Oppenheimer would be a disaster. Uh, people told him that uh, Oppenheimer couldn't run a hot dog stand. Oppenheimer was a fascinating and complicated man. Fundamentally, he seems to have had some of the qualities of an actor. He was different things to different people. Oppenheimer drew luminaries like Enrico Fermi, Hans Bitta, and Edward Teller to the facility, as well as technicians fresh out of college. During the fall of 1942, the theoretical physicists at Los Alamos began the difficult process of trying to determine how much U-235 it would take to make a bomb. And the scientists tell him, well, it could be uh, X amount, but uh, that's a plus or minus uh, by a factor of 10. Uh, uh, Groves is, is absolutely staggered. He uses the illustration that, um, well, you're giving a wedding, and um, uh, you, you say it's for 100 people, but maybe 1,000 will turn up, or maybe 10. So uh, how can you make any sort of plan? Robert Oppenheimer's team of physicists doubled the amount of uranium-235 thought necessary to achieve critical mass and sustain an explosive chain reaction to 200 kilograms. Their calculation, made without adequate samples of U-235 for tests, would prove to be 10 times the required amount. It was important that the critical mass was not too small. That would make nuclear bombs too cheap and easy to make. But equally, it was important that the critical mass was not too large, as this would make deliverable bombs an impossibility. The main obstacle was how to quickly assemble two smaller subcritical masses into one larger explosive one. The bomb design that they came up with was a gun design. Inside the bomb, a cannon would fire one piece of radioactive fuel into another at 3,000 feet per second. The pieces would have to come together fast enough to prevent spontaneously emitted neutrons from melting the fuel, causing the bomb to fizzle rather than explode. engineering aspects were daunting. It's one thing to say you can shoot a piece of uranium at a second piece, but how do you do it? How fast does it have to go? How do you stop it at the end? How do you keep it together long enough as a mass so that it does go high order and give you an atomic bomb? The scientists at Los Alamos also study tampers, barrier materials that would slow the expansion of the critical mass and reflect neutrons back to feed the fission process inside the bomb. On December 28, 1942, President Roosevelt approved an additional $500 million investment in the Manhattan Project. The first priority to build the massive industrial facilities that would produce the fissionable material to fuel the atom bomb. Though they wanted people to believe a nuclear explosion was possible, it was also important that not just anyone could do it, that it was not replicable without extreme cost. And so they would make the nuclear fuel as difficult to make as possible. There is also a huge profit motive for doing this. There are vast sums of money to be made from supposed nuclear fuel, from its production and from its protection, transportation and storage before and after use. These gigantic structures contained multiple calutrons, box-shaped collection units that were configured in a racetrack layout. A magnetic field passed throughout the entire oval of calutrons, causing the divergence of streams of U-235 and U-238 so that the separated isotopes could be collected. A single calutron could capture a mere 10 grams of U-235 daily. A staggering total of 1,152 would be built by war's end. Because of the intense time constraints, Groves could not afford to build pilot plants, facilities to test the scaling up of the laboratory processes. They're physically building Oak Ridge and Y-12, the electro electromagnetic separation plant, uh, before the design drawings had even been approved. And it's incredible that you would never do this. Groves was not content to rely on just two approaches, Y-12 and Hempert, to produce the weapons-grade fuel for the bomb. By September 1943, he had begun construction on a third, K-25, a gigantic gaseous diffusion plant at Oak Ridge. 
and a diffusion process of gaseous compound, uranium pentafluoride, passes through a cascade of barriers, each one giving a slight enrichment of the lighter isotope, U-235. The difficulty lay in finding a barrier that would not be degraded by the very corrosive gas. Scientists and engineers were not able to manufacture a satisfactory barrier until a year after site construction began on K-25. A building that would ultimately cover more area than any structure ever built. The U-shape measured half a mile long by a thousand feet wide. With an area of two million square feet, it contained a series of sealed containers and cascades that ran the length of the building. If anybody asks you what you're making a bridge, you tell them you're making the, uh, the lights for the lightning bugs, or that you're making the um, uh, holes for the donuts, ha <laughs> ha. Huge industrial facilities were commissioned and built without any significant evidence a deliverable bomb was possible. There always was doubt that nuclear fuel could be produced in sufficient quantities whilst maintaining a pure product. Fission is more readily produced in a rare uranium isotope, uranium-235. It occurs naturally at a ratio of 1 to 139 to its less useful twin, uranium-238. Chemically identical, the isotopes were almost impossible to separate. The only workable method in 1942 was electromagnetic separation. In this process, a mass spectrometer used for separating electrically charged particles according to their mass sent a stream of uranium atoms past a magnet. Atoms of the lighter isotope U-235 would be deflected more than those of the heavier U-238 and would be captured one atom at a time. Scientists at Columbia University championed a competing mode of separation, gaseous diffusion. This method passed the isotope through a porous barrier that separated the lighter isotope from its heavier counterpart, but it proved to be technically challenging. In a uh, square centimeter, about the size of a thumbnail, you've got to have hundreds of millions of pores and they have to all be the same size. If they're too big, the gas flows through without any separation. If they're too small, the gas gets in there and condenses on the surface, it won't go through. So they, 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 you talk about obstacles. But if a suitable barrier could be manufactured, it promised a greater yield than the electromagnetic process. Both techniques would have to be done on a massive scale. This could well all be an entirely fraudulent exercise that takes uranium and turns it into expensive uranium. This can be done simply by changing the label. A new man-made element, plutonium, was gaining favor as a possible fuel. Identified in 1941, plutonium was almost twice as likely to undergo fission as uranium-235 and could be produced on a large scale by irradiating uranium in nuclear reactors. In order to produce plutonium, three production reactors were designed by engineers at the University of Chicago that would be built in Hanford, Washington. Groves initiated the construction at Hanford on August 27, 1943. Though plutonium may exist in theory, it is likely that it can only be produced in trace quantities and not in sufficient quantity or purity to establish what its attributes are, nor in that which would be required for a bomb. The qualities of plutonium are highly convenient. Not only is it highly fissionable, but also castable and machinable. These qualities were improved by alloying plutonium with gallium, though other elements were tried. Gallium also supposedly lowers the susceptibility of plutonium to corrosion. The isotope we produced uh, was plutonium-238, uh, produced by the deuteron bombardment of uranium. Then a month later, uh, joined by Emilio Sagre, we uh, identified in this room the isotope of importance, plutonium-239, and uh, isolated it so that it could be uh, have its uh, fission properties uh, uh, measured at the 37-inch uh, cyclotron. But Hanford depended as much on chemical separation as it did on the reactors. The chemistry was Glenn Seaborg's, massively scaled up from his University of Chicago team's ultra-microchemical work. We had been working with what you call tracer amounts, uh, invisible amounts, uh, detected by its radioactivity but we couldn't deduce the chemical properties with certainty that way. We needed to work with actual ponderable, weighable amounts, and that's why we produced uh, weighable amounts of plutonium in this way. This meant that we had to work, I say we are the chemists uh, working with me, on what they call an ultra-micro-chemical scale. It was looking less and less likely that enough U-235 could be produced to impact the war. At the same time, the alternative, plutonium, was proving to be equally tricky. Impurities in this new element were leading to increased neutron activity that would cause bombs to pre-detonate 
to fill before the two halves joined in a critical mass. There are production problems at Oak Ridge. They're not sure they can even make any uranium at that point, uranium-235. And so if they can't use plutonium in a gun, there may, in fact, not even be an atomic bomb. It's a real crisis. It's at that point that uh, I think Oppenheimer's talent comes to the fore, where he brings in the people, new people, in fact, and he reorganizes Los Alamos. Scientists and dignitaries awaited the detonation of the first atomic bomb in a desolate area of the New Mexico desert, known aptly as Juanada del Muerto, or Journey of Death. They had taken bets on how much power the creation might unleash, but many wondered whether the weapon would work at all. But as the test date drew closer, there was a nagging uncertainty about whether the bomb would actually work at all. In a meeting before the test, Hans Bethe described all that was known about the bomb and what wasn't. Litchfield and I overruled Fermi and that is a very dangerous thing to do because Fermi was almost always right. But we overruled him and so I felt uncertain for that reason. What was thought of during the war was, and very often we kept saying, maybe we'll come across some insuperable physical obstacle which prevents it from working. You can easily imagine those things. For example, a little delay in the emission of fast neutrons after fission. Norman Ramsey bet low. And I bet zero. And I, I think that was the most intelligent bet of any because zero included not only zero, but it also included the first 25 generations of neutrons I mean, this is an exponentially growing thing, so it's probably the first 35 generations of neutrons. If it stopped anywhere along there, it would be zero in the scale that they had. So I had the biggest number of, statistically, the best chance of winning. Very hard to sleep, very hard to get your minds off all the things that might have gone wrong, very hard not to think about the implications. But, you know, we all, I think we were consumed with the job, especially this crucial one, a test fire to see if this whole idea would work. And that was uh, in everyone's mind, I think. Everybody was extremely excited to, to see if it actually would turn out to be that way, because no one really knew whether the thing would work or not. It was determined that explosive means would do the job by taking a subcritical mass and making it critical so the radioactive material would detonate. Two methods to do that had been devised. One was a gun method, where two halves of subcritical material were shot together to form the critical mass, starting the nuclear detonation. It was discovered the gun method would work with uranium, but not with plutonium. The gun method was the easiest, but the science of implosion would have to be developed also. It required science and engineering that would enable simultaneous and uniform compression of plutonium. Because nothing like this had ever been created, the plutonium weapon would also have to be tested. The plutonium bomb's new configuration called for an outer shell of explosives that would direct symmetrical shockwaves inward, compressing a subcritical central mass of plutonium. The resulting increase in the density would shrink distances between nuclei, thus starting the explosive chain reactor. Nobody had ever taken high explosives, wrapped them around something, and got a symmetrical, symmetrical explosion. And so they weren't even sure they could do that technically. It was a very, very tough engineering problem. Lenses were created, explosive lenses that would focus the shock wave inward to compress the subcritical mass to critical. High explosives were mixed to form the cocoon the fissionable material would rest in. The molds for the lenses were the biggest problems. The molten explosive had to be cooled just right to prevent air bubbles which would interfere with the detonation. The lenses required precision casting with machine finishing. Tolerances for the hundred or so pieces had to fit together within a few thousandths of an inch. Inside the very center of the bomb was an initiator surrounded by a sphere of plutonium. This sphere was encased within a set of symmetrically located high explosive lenses creating an implosion which forced the plutonium into itself, attaining critical mass. But what if the real test was unsuccessful? The fissionable material might be lost from the detonation of the high explosive surrounding it. The decision was made early on to contain any misfire inside a huge steel vessel. It was 25 feet long, 12 feet in diameter, 14 inches thick, and weighed 214 tons. It was called Jumbo. By the time it was delivered, though, production of the fissionable material had increased, and there was greater confidence in the success of the bomb. 
use of Jumbo was canceled. Instead, it was hung from a tower 800 yards from ground zero. They canceled the use of Jumbo because at this point they had decided to fake it, and use of Jumbo would make the bomb be perceived as undeliverable. Before assembly began, a receipt was signed for the plutonium, value at least several hundred million dollars. At the moment the receipt was signed, the test shifted to military control. Uh, they didn't allow many people, but they did allow me, and I, I looked with, I closed, uh, had one eye protected. I couldn't uh, look with both eyes, and so I was looking with just one eye. All the scientists were 20 miles away, but most feared a dud. Especially since a blank test of the explosive surrounding the core had failed just days before. Sensors showed that they had not fired simultaneously, and would not have compressed the core properly. It was really unnerving when the blank shot failed. The normal anxiety that one might have had uh, with a device on which you had worked, but had never been tested fully, uh, was heightened by, the, by the, uh, the failure of the blank shot. General Groves was lying on the ground in the prone position, facing away from the blast. What he said was going through his mind was, what was he going to do when the timer got to zero and nothing happened? Five, four, three... Two, one. Despite the uncertainty and the doubts, the implosion device worked first time. With all the technical difficulty they admit to in making such a device, would you not expect a good few failures before you got it right? Of course, it worked first time because they faked it. As with all subsequent nuclear tests, it was fake. The world entered the atomic age with an intense flash, a sudden wave of heat, followed by a tremendous shockwave. The ball of fire extended 40,000 feet. The bomb packed a punch equivalent to 20,000 tons of TNT, completely vaporizing the steel tower and heating the desert sand into glass for a radius of 800 yards. Later in the morning, Fermi and physicist Herbert Anderson donned white surgical scrubs and rode in two lead-lined tanks to ground zero. Fermi's tank broke down after only a mile, and he had to walk back. Is there any reason they didn't want Fermi to see the evidence firsthand? With a yield 200 times greater than the 100-ton test, the fireball created a crater nearly one-half mile across and fused the desert sand into a green glass still containing traces of radioactivity 15 years later. The radiated dust and debris from the blast, fallout, would fall onto neighboring communities. At a few locations, detectors showed rises in radioactivity, but they dropped quickly. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. The 
explosions were mostly created using large towers of hundreds of tons of TNT. A short time before the Trinity test, they detonated such a tower of 108 tons of TNT. The Trinity test was probably a larger such tower of 1,018 tons of TNT. May 1945. The hot New Mexico desert seemed far from the ravages of war in Europe. The trick relies on encouraging people to believe a big explosion is a massive one. With eyewitnesses this is achieved through distance. From a distance it is difficult to know how big an explosion is. Most will accept it as being as big as they are told it is. It was very big after all. The trick also relies on people's propensity to exaggerate when recalling experience. It would have been the biggest explosion any of them had ever seen, and so they are likely to tell anyone who asked that it was big, in fact very big. They are unlikely to play it down and say, well, it wasn't all that big, actually. For many of them, it would have been the most interesting thing that had ever happened in their lives, and so they would tend to big it up. In order to accurately calibrate the instrumentation for the test, another test, one using only high explosives, was needed. A dress rehearsal of 100 tons of TNT was planned for. Hundreds of crates of high explosives were stacked on the platform of a 20-foot tower. Tubes of low-level nuclear material were scattered throughout the explosives to simulate the radioactive products of a nuclear blast. Everything was set to a scale to match the expected effects of the nuclear test shot. On May 7th, the high explosive was detonated. The orange fireball was seen 60 miles away. How big is this explosion? How big you perceive it to be depends very much on how far you think it is away and what you have to compare it to. The myth of the blinding light that supposedly makes nuclear bombs distinct from conventional ones is achieved using floodlighting and possibly mirrors and possibly through the burning of elements such as magnesium within the explosion itself. It is often illustrated to the public with shots of extreme shadowing which can easily be created in a studio. Most witnesses will never actually see the supposed blinding light, as they were usually told to close and cover their eyes, and often to turn their backs. Often the illusion was reinforced with protective goggles and clothing. The footage is generally put together using footage of smaller explosions, without anything in shot to provide size comparison, mixed with footage of the sun, sunsets, and clouds filmed using time-lapse photography. There is little or no unedited footage provided to the public. Almost all of the footage has cuts, and often cuts away to shots of observers, or shots illustrating the supposed destructive force, and back again to the footage of the developing aftermath of the explosion, and then away again and back again. And so, the public rarely sees a so-called nuclear explosion, complete in one continuous sequence, Mushroom clouds are not unique to so-called nuclear explosions. The illusion of nuclear weapons was also manufactured with the use of very large conventional bombs, fuel air bombs or thermobaric or vacuum bombs. Up close and from a distance, they could easily be mistaken for mythical, much larger so-called nuclear bombs. But it was one unique conventional bomb that was the climax of high explosives in Vietnam. Called Big Blue 82, it was a blockbuster that caused injuries for miles. At 15,000 pounds, a single bomb was the entire cargo for the journey into hostile airspace.
crater was enormous and the destruction total. You're about to witness the mother of all bombs. The massive Ordnance Air Blast Bomb, or MOAB, 10 tons of H6 explosive. When they were testing it, um, people actually thought they were testing small-scale nuclear devices. Plus the psychological effect of the nuclear-style mushroom cloud is undeniable. Russian military has announced the testing of a vacuum explosive device that unleashes a shockwave with the power of a nuclear weapon, according to Russian scientists. U.S. forces have used a thermobaric bomb, which works on similar principles in their campaign against al-Qaeda and Taliban forces. The first and most obvious question people ask when confronted with the idea that nuclear weapons may be a hoax is what about Hiroshima and Nagasaki? While the scientists at Trinity site waited for the test in the New Mexico desert, the primary components of the gun-type uranium weapon were being hoisted aboard the cruiser Indianapolis. The ship set sail for the Pacific island of Tinian in the Marianas. A few weeks later, on August 6, 1945, a B-29 named Enola Gay took off in the early morning hours. Just after 8 a.m., it dropped the weapon named Little Boy, which exploded approximately a thousand feet over the Japanese city of Hiroshima. Boom! The uranium gun weapon, or Little Boy bomb, was a simple design, and scientists were confident it would work without testing. Designers considered a test prior to combat use unnecessary and impossible since there was only enough U-235 for one bomb. And so Little Boy goes into combat as an untested weapon. In the past 24 hours, four heavily loaded B-29s have crashed on takeoff. Parsons' greatest nightmare is the catastrophic consequences of a similar crash this time with a fully armed atomic bomb on board. Disregarding months of planning, he makes a last-minute decision to attempt the arming of the bomb in the air and not on the ground, something which has never been tried outside the controlled, sterile environment of the laboratory. Armed with just a screwdriver and a spanner, he spends hour after hour practicing the techniques required to arm the bomb in flight. The temperature inside the bomb bay soars to over 40 degrees, but he continues, even as his hands start to bleed. There is no room for error. The next time he does this will be for real, 31,000 feet up in the sky, exactly two hours away from the target. This is padding the narrative in order to make the very dull story of dropping a bomb more exciting and to sculpt it into a triumph against the odds. The footage of the mushroom cloud over Hiroshima appears to be two plumes of smoke filmed in such a way as to make it look like one larger plume of smoke. Eight eighteen. My God, what have we done?
The damage to Hiroshima and Nagasaki is not consistent with one single blast. The damage is uniform. Wooden structures have been burned away. More substantial buildings remain with roofs and other flammable parts burned. It is remarkably similar to the damage caused by conventional firebombing. In Hamburg, Darmstadt, Kassel and most notably Dresden, firebombing was used in such a way as to create an effect known as a firestorm, where a fire attains such intensity that it creates a central column of rising hot air, inducing strong inward winds which supply oxygen to the fire, which significantly increases combustion. The better comparison to make is with Tokyo, where the construction of buildings was more comparable and conventional firebombing led to a similar death toll, casualty figures and damage. Japanese cities consisted mostly of wooden dwellings and burned easily. Hiroshima and Nagasaki and Tokyo were destroyed by fire. This is not in dispute. It is claimed that in Hiroshima and Nagasaki that a singular atom bomb caused these fires. It is likely that Hiroshima and Nagasaki were firebombed in much the same way as Tokyo, and that the story of Little Boy and Fat Man is entirely fictional. At 8.15 in the morning of August 6, Japanese time, the first atomic bomb hit an enemy target. The bomb was aimed to explode above zero point, a spot in the city at the junction of the Motoiso and Ota rivers. The bomb was intentionally set to explode well above the zero point to dissipate its radioactivity. Here is the pictorial record of the result. At zero point, directly beneath the explosion, the soldier in the scene is pointing at the spot from which all damage to the surrounding area was measured in terms of distance from the center of the blast. Within a mile of zero point, the devastation speaks for itself. But in these very ruins, army cameramen have found and filmed pictorial evidence that tells in twisted steel and stone the effect of death dealing atomic power. For example, this was the site of the main Japanese military headquarters. There were approximately 20,000 Japanese military personnel stationed here. They are among the missing. A lone concrete smokestack indicates where a bustling factory once stood. Reinforced concrete buildings seem to have withstood the explosion fairly well, the damage varying with their distance from zero point. Within an area of a mile to a mile and a half, this type of building was the only type to withstand complete demolition and destruction. Here's a building that was actually knocked sideways, giving you an idea of the force of the blast. The direction of the blast is graphically told by the slant of this parapet, a concrete wall. Etched in the stone base of what was the Russo-Japanese War Memorial are telltale lines, atomic handwriting for all to read. Another signpost of the direction and force of the explosion is blasted in the polished granite base of this statue. The light surface indicates the angle of the blast, two-tenths of a mile from zero point. Many of the shattered windows pointed like skeleton fingers the direction of the atomic wind of death. On one side, blown in. On the other, blown out with atomic tornado force. Inside, the flash burns on the chairs give eloquent testimony on the heat of the blast a mile from zero point, which singed the mohair upholstery like a blowtorch. Hiroshima City Hall, which stood at an angle of 45 degrees to the direction of the explosion, had its doors and windows blown in, but suffered much less damage than buildings squarely in the path of the blast. The windows and doors offer mute evidence of the way the blast swept into the structures. The destructive circle within a mile from zero point had a few notable exceptions, mainly reinforced concrete. On the edge of the area of greatest damage was a landmark, the Red Cross Hospital, which never ceased functioning, although it sustained damage. Today, it dominates the desert of a debris that was Hiroshima. Another notable exception to the general demolition was the Higashi Railroad Station in East Hiroshima, a mile and a half from the center of the blast. This building, however, suffered extensive damage. The twisted steel beams and concrete walls show the effects of the tremendous concussion. What's left of the Commercial Museum? 
within two-tenths of a mile of zero point also gives indication of the tremendous push of the explosion. The downward force of the blast turned the roof of the commercial museum into a reservoir. Amazingly enough, bridges did not suffer too badly at Hiroshima. This steel rail bridge, one mile from zero point, had the side toward the explosion virtually blasted by flying particles, which removed almost all the paint. But the side away from the explosion did not need a new paint job. Roads in the area fared better than buildings or bridges. Shortly after the fires died down, traffic was resumed. Today, these highways through the ruins are again in use. Beside our military traffic trudge the survivors of vanished Hiroshima, the first city in history to be atom-bombed into oblivion. It would be easy to ensure the bomber crews responsible for the firebombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki didn't survive the war. And it would be easy to convince people to lie, with bribes and with the idea that it is a noble lie that would bring an end to the war. Where is the big black scorch mark we saw from the bird's eye view of the Trinity site? It's all so much more dramatic when you add dramatic music. Trinity had been a success. Questions remained about Fat Man. Three days later, another mission carrying the plutonium implosion weapon named Fat Man detonated over Nagasaki. Hopefully by now you're beginning to see this for what it is, pure Hollywood. The uranium gun weapon, or little boy bomb, was detonated over Hiroshima at an altitude of 1800 feet, the height to achieve maximum blast effect. Three days later, a fat man implosion bomb was detonated over Nagasaki. In Hiroshima, 70,000 people were killed or listed as missing. Of its 90,000 buildings, over 60,000 were demolished. The implosion bomb dropped on Nagasaki took the lives of 42,000 people and injured 40,000 more. It destroyed 39% of all the buildings in the city. With a yield of 20 kilotons, similar to that of Trinity, this weapon will be considered a nominal atomic bomb and provide a blueprint for all future nuclear weapons. These skulls in the foreground are very illustrative. Throw in a nice emotive baby playing in the rubble. Burn victims are in no way evidence of nuclear detonation. 
standard heat will cause burns. Burn victims are indicative of firebombing. Radiation is also not proof of nuclear detonation. Radiation can easily be faked. It merely needs to be claimed. But as we have seen from the TNT test at Los Alamos, radioactive material can be spread by conventional explosives, and so presumably conventional bombs. However, there is no significant evidence of any long-term radiological contamination of either Hiroshima or Nagasaki. After Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the American military proceeded to stretch the truth even further than they had before. Next came Operation Crossroads at Bikini Atoll. Crossroads consisted of two tests, the first codenamed Abel, the second codenamed Baker. The supposed purpose of Crossroads was to test the effect of nukes on naval hardware, though many say it was a way of getting rid of surplus military ships left over from the war. The bomb will not start a chain reaction in the water, converting it all to gas and letting all the ships on all the oceans drop down to the bottom. It will not blow out the bottom of the sea and let all the water run down the hole. It will not destroy gravity. I am not an atomic playboy, as one of my critics labeled me, exploding these bombs to satisfy my personal whim. By dismissing the absurd, you can camouflage the ridiculous as plausible. Abel, supposedly dropped from a plane, was likely a large conventional bomb. The bomb missed its intended target by nearly 800 yards. Baker, a much bigger explosion, was probably large amounts of submerged explosives. Soon enough, the Soviets would begin to build their own fake nuclear bombs. August 29th, 1949. The Soviets faked their first atomic bomb. Making a device that will cause a nuclear explosion is one thing. Making deliverable nuclear bombs is a further challenge. Mass manufacturing these devices so that they can be stockpiled, ready for use as and when needed, brings with it further difficulty. It is not denied that nuclear weapons have a lifespan. This is good for the industry, as the need for periodical replacement generates ongoing revenue. Two years after Crossroads, authority was given by President Truman to proceed with Operation Sandstone. three devices utilized on sandstone employed new technology to double the explosive force of the bomb using the same amount of plutonium spent over Nagasaki. This technology met Department of Defense requirements for more efficient bombs and increased the ability to stockpile nuclear weapons. The results of sandstone affected the design of future nuclear weapons, rendering the Mark III production components of the Fat Man bomb obsolete. The Mark IV and Mark V designs brought improved performance and lighter weight to nuclear weapons. The purpose of sandstone, and later greenhouse, was to incrementally double and double again the power of these fictional bombs. 
At first by using the nuclear fuel more efficiently, and then by adding elements, primarily isotopes of hydrogen, deuterium and tritium. This would ultimately lead to the myth of the fusion bomb, many times bigger again. Also during this period, they would invent a way of utilising U-238 within the bombs. Before they had wanted to maintain the idea that making nuclear bombs was very difficult due to the production method of plutonium and the separation method for U-235 being difficult, time-consuming and producing very small quantities with very high production costs. The use of ordinary uranium-238 was required to make it conceivable for them to continue making bigger and bigger bombs requiring more and more fissionable material and to make a large number of them. It was also very convenient as large quantities of uranium-238 were left over from the process of isolating uranium-235. Though uranium-235 and or plutonium would continue to be an essential element of each fictional fission bomb. A fourth test on Operation Greenhouse was the item test, about a 45 and a half kiloton test in which tritium was burned in the very center of the nuclear explosion. And this process of putting tritium at the very center of the, of the nuclear weapon is called boosting. And we kicked the yield up from about 20 kilotons to 45 and a half kilotons, more than doubling it by that process. on Greenhouse was the George event. Now George is a large 225 kiloton weapon that was used to burn a deuterium capsule. And this is the first of our thermonuclear weapon experiments to ever be conducted. October 3rd, 1952, the British faked their first atom bomb. It was supposedly detonated inside the hull of a frigate, 8 feet 10 inches below the waterline. It was likely just a frigate filled with large quantities of explosives. Dr. Penny gives the order for the weapon to be fired at 8 o'clock next morning. One scientist remains to arm the firing circuit.
mix the switches. One, two, three. Now the key. Turning the circuit into position to fire. That's it. The weapon is ready to explode at the touch of control headquarters on an island some miles away. But it can't be fired before this man gets there, since he carries a safety link, and without that link the firing circuit is still open. Inside headquarters, the rest of the control party are waiting at their instruments. In the half-light of the control room, the safety link is delivered to the controller. The final process of firing can now be set in track. Time bracket open. Fox George, this is how one. Pass your message, over. Hello, how one, this is Fox George. A Saturn completed. Over. Understand. A Saturn completed. Out. Right. You can put the safety key in now. Safety link in. Circuit complete. Can we have the all ready signals, please? Mr. Abercrombie, please. Thank you. Minus eight and a half minutes. Situated on the Zero Island was the cab, or building, which housed the device. The mic device was known as a wet bomb, because it used liquid hydrogen isotopes to create the thermonuclear reaction. This made the device very large, weighing some 62 tons, and impractical to use as a deliverable weapon. A plywood tube ran from the Zero Island across the causeways to a detection station on the farthest island a distance of nearly two miles. This too was filled with helium, allowing lethal radioactive rays faster travel to the detection station before the item was consumed by the fireball. A two-story, 82-ton steel cylinder containing a concentric series of thermos bottles which housed the super-chilled liquid deuterium, the hydrogen fuel, as well as raw uranium, tritium, Teller's plutonium spark plug, 
lead baffles, gold leaf reflectors, an ablative polyethylene lining, and, sitting at the very top of the assembly, a Nagasaki-style fission bomb to get it all going. The mechanism, along with its support and refrigeration gear, required a hangar-sized building called a shot cab to house it. The pipes leading off to the right were for observation purposes. They would carry the initial bomb light down a two-mile wooden tunnel to sensors on a neighboring island. Cruiser Estes ordered the capacitors of the fission primary to simultaneously discharge into 92 detonators. The resulting shock waves raced through the high explosive shell, converging on and compressing the plutonium sphere into a supercritical metallic fluid and crushing the tiny initiator at its core, releasing a few dozen neutrons to start the chain reaction. Million degree x-rays outran the blast wave by milliseconds, racing down the radiation channels to immolate the interior plastic lining and send it crashing inward toward the plutonium spark plug suspended within the now superheating liquid deuterium. Pressure from the fissioning spark plug touched off a fusion reaction in the tritium at its core. The expanding shockwave met the inwardly rushing radiation to further compress the deuterium. Hydrogen atoms began to fuse, momentarily creating every element that had ever existed in the universe, and a couple more besides. A few millionths of a second after receiving its orders from the Estes, Mike had burst free of its thermos bottle and was heading for the upper stratosphere. Fusion bombs were most commonly referred to as hydrogen or H-bombs. This may be because they have nothing to do with fusion of hydrogen into helium, but simply that in order to fake bigger and bigger bombs, the igniting of large quantities of concentrated hydrogen was required, rather than the towers of TNT utilised in the earlier fake fission bomb tests. In 1953, the Soviets faked their first so-called hydrogen bomb. In the spring of 1953, the Atomic Energy Commission and the Department of Defense conducted 11 nuclear weapon tests in Nevada under the code name Upshot Knothole. The first of the events, code named Encore, was a 27 kiloton nuclear device airdrop and detonated at about 2,800 feet to Grable. And it was delivered by the Army's new artillery cannon, a 280 millimeter projectile was fired and detonated over about the same blast area with a yield of about 15 kilotons at an altitude of about 500 feet. As well as making their fictional bombs progressively more powerful, they would also push the idea that at the same time these fictional bombs can be progressively shrunk. They have gone as far as convincing the public that they can be fitted into a suitcase and that you can fit up to ten of them on the end of an intercontinental ballistic missile.
Castle Bravo, the largest device ever detonated in atmospheric testing by the United States. Bravo was a hydrogen bomb using solid thermonuclear fuel, confirming the designs of Edward Teller and Stan Ullum, and paving the way to producing aircraft deliverable hydrogen bombs and more effective weapons. Castle Bravo was supposedly a smaller device than I in mind, though more powerful, though the building it was housed in was of a similar size. Significantly exceeding its expected yield by two and a half times, Castle Bravo, with an explosive power of 15 megatons, stripped islands clean of vegetation and took the scientists by surprise. The huge explosion released large quantities of radioactive debris into the atmosphere. This incident pushed the dangers of fallout from nuclear weapons clearly into the public mind. Almost nine years had passed since the cancellation of the deep underwater test on Operation Crossroads. That test was finally conducted as Operation Wigwam. Despite their initial size, they convinced the public with ease that fictional hydrogen bombs could be reduced in size sufficiently so that they could be dropped from aircraft or delivered by missile. Operation Red Wing was conducted in the Pacific, primarily to test high-yield thermonuclear devices. Cherokee event would be the first delivery by U.S. aircraft of a thermonuclear weapon. This weapon would detonate with a yield of three and a half megatons almost 200 times the power of the Trinity device.
General Bernard A. Schriever is one of the first to suggest the H-bomb should be miniaturized to fit on an intercontinental ballistic missile, or ICBM. In the fall of 1957, with test moratoriums looming on the horizon, 24 nuclear tests were conducted in the Nevada desert under the code name Operation Plumbob. During Plumbob, the Hood event would become the largest test ever conducted in the atmosphere within the continental United States. Hood, a 74 kiloton device, was suspended 1,500 feet above the desert floor on a balloon. While new weapon designs continue to be tested, the Department of Defense used the series to accelerate military training in nuclear warfare while continuing its study of the effects from nuclear explosions. Much of the nuclear testing was designed in such a way as to expose as many military personnel to the hoax as possible so that they would perpetuate the myth by word of mouth and so that as many people as possible would have an uncle or some other relative who was involved and so would likely consider nuclear weapons a reality. The 21st test, conducted during Operation Plumbob, was the Rainier event. This was the first fully contained underground nuclear weapon detonation conducted by the United States. The three kiloton device was detonated 790 feet below Rainier Mesa, vaporizing a rock into a molten bubble 100 feet wide. This technology would have great importance after the limited test ban treaty, which would prohibit all but underground testing of nuclear weapons and hide future experiments from prying eyes. Underground tests are very easily claimed. For many, no footage is produced at all. Though it can be argued that underground you might better maintain a critical mass, it is likely that all underground tests are just as fake as those above ground. During Operation Hartag, the United States detonated 35 nuclear devices, as many as had been fired in all prior Pacific tests. By now, nuclear weapon tests were perceived in large part as saber-rattling, increasing the international tensions that could lead to all-out nuclear war. They've pretended to drop them from aircraft, shot one out of a cannon, hung them from balloons, exploded them underwater and underground. Why not blast a few into space on rockets? circuits from Hawaii to New Zealand. Immediately following shots Teak and Orange in the Pacific, 
the United States conducted Operation Argus, three one kiloton missile borne tests in the South Atlantic. The objective of the Argus experiment was to take a close look at the phenomena associated with the trapping in the Earth's magnetic field of relativistic electrons produced by nuclear detonations at very high altitudes. It was necessary to learn the governing parameters of these phenomena so we can make reliable estimates of their military importance. There seemed to be a good possibility that they were very important, and for that reason, there was a pressure on this entire operation to secure quick results. A fleet consisting of nine ships headed out for the South Atlantic. It is here that the Earth's magnetic field dips to its lowest point in what is known as the South Atlantic Anomaly. Three X-17A missiles are launched from the deck of the USS Norton Sound. missile's one kiloton warhead detonates at an altitude of 300 miles. As Christophilus had predicted, charged particles from the detonation travel along the lines of the Earth's magnetic field, temporarily creating a new belt of high-intensity radiation. For one of the most significant findings of Argus is that the detonation of a nuclear device in the ionosphere could create selective blackouts of radio communications. Cactus event. This is a little 18 kiloton device that produced a crater about 137 feet across to 37 feet deep. Many years later, 1980, all of the fission debris and radioactive material on Inuitak Atoll was gathered up and dumped into the cactus crater and then a concrete dome was placed over the crater to keep and to stabilize the radioactive material that had been contained in it. They swept all the radioactive material under a dome-shaped concrete carpet. By November of 1958, the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union begin test ban negotiations in Geneva. With the exception of three French tests in the Sahara, the world is spared the rumble of atomic blasts for the next 34 months. At Regan, deep in the Sahara, France goes forward with the detonation of her first atomic bomb, defying a United Nations resolution, the heated protests of Japan, and most of Africa's newly independent nations, and the disapproval of both America and the Soviet. Since the autumn of 1958, Britain, the United States, and Russia have voluntarily suspended nuclear tests and for 15 months have been trying to reach agreement on a formula to ban all atomic weapons development. Now, France presses forward with this first in a series of firings to force her way into the exclusive nuclear club. This first blast is on a level with bombs exploded over Hiroshima and Nagasaki in World War II. The 150th nuclear weapon explosion in history carries France a step further towards General de Gaulle's dream of national glory restored. Within two years, a dozen Atlas D missiles are deployed and operational. The first hardened squadron of Atlas launchers are turned over to the Strategic Air Command in August 1960. The missiles are deployed within blast-protected structures called coffin launchers. Even greater protection is afforded by the silo launcher. The new Titan ICBM is designed for silo launching. The Titan I is heavier, sturdier, and has greater lift capacity than the Atlas. While the early models of the Titan I are armed with a 3.8 megaton warhead, the Titan II would become the largest ICBM the United States would ever deploy. By the end of 1961, Atlas squadrons expand to a total of 57 operational missiles. Uncertainty 
over the potential glut of Soviet ICBMs presses upon military planners. The R-9 and R-16 are competing designs for the Soviet response to the Titan I, each with a range of 6,000 miles. An inherent deficiency shared by both the U.S. and Soviet ICBMs is their use of non-storable liquid fuel. Liquid fuel missiles require hazardous and time-consuming fueling procedures prior to launch. The greatest disadvantage of these missiles is response time. With the early warning for ICBMs coming over the pole at 15 minutes, rapid response is critical. Solid fuel missiles, however, can be launched on command. Advances in solid fuel propulsion lead to the contract for the Minuteman, the world's first solid fuel ICBM. Holding a temporary advantage in numbers of strategic missiles, the United States has reason to remain vigilant when it comes to Soviet nuclear weapons expertise. For two years, an uneasy moratorium on weapon testing continued between the United States and the Soviet Union. Secretly, the Soviets began designing new weapons of mass destruction, including a 57 megaton hydrogen bomb, the largest nuclear weapon ever built. This monster bomb was a scaled-down version of a 100-megaton design and was aircraft deliverable. Russians had shattered the voluntary moratorium. The United States would soon follow suit with an extensive series of weapon tests for massive retaliation. Concern arises that the U.S. is falling behind in nuclear weapons development. The next month, the Soviets conduct several high-altitude tests. The results permit them to develop data similar to that of the Teak and Argus series. Tensions mounted as nearly 100 nuclear tests were conducted between the Nevada test site and the Pacific Ocean under the code names Nougat, Storax, and Dominic. Operations resumed at Johnston Island and Christmas Island during Operation Dominic. The United States negotiated the use of Christmas Island from the British, who had used the island to conduct their own thermonuclear tests. Multi-megaton nuclear weapons were loaded aboard B-52 strategic bomber aircraft, delivered from Hawaii, and airdropped off the south end of Christmas Island.
come back and test in the Operation Dominic the Fishbowl series. The Fishbowl was reserved for the uh, high altitude tests and we did six more. Most of the experiments were related to communications, degradation, high altitude EMP, and radar blackout, and radar jitter, radar scattering. Starfish Prime, the first test in the Fishbowl series, lifts off from Johnston Island atop a four missile. Reaching an altitude over five times higher than Teak in 1958, the Starfish Fireball enters the Van Allen Belt, igniting a violent auroral display. The bomb's electromagnetic pulse effect is pronounced in Hawaii, causing blown fuses and radar blackouts throughout the Hawaiian Islands. A shower of highly charged radiation spreads rapidly into the regions of near space frequently traveled by Earth's artificial satellites. This government has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. October 25th. Amidst escalating world tensions, Blue Guild Triple Prime is successfully launched and detonated. On the 28th, at the height of the crisis, the Soviets conduct a high-altitude nuclear test requiring the launching of three ballistic missiles. November 1st. White House struggles to verify that Soviet missiles in Cuba have in fact been disabled. Despite this destabilizing factor, both the U.S. and the Soviets conduct high-altitude nuclear tests on the same day. The high-altitude nuclear tests appear just as fake as those faked at lower altitudes. Some appear to be achieved by dropping packets of powder onto a hard surface that explode on impact. Following tightrope, the final atmospheric test by the United States, negotiations begin for the Test Ban Treaty of 1963. In 1963, we entered the Limited Test Ban Treaty that prohibits any atmospheric testing. Prohibitions of nuclear testing, moratoriums, talks and treaties, reinforce the supposed threat and allows the power structure to pose as rational peacemakers and allows for the demonization of those who supposedly don't adhere and also helps prevent lesser countries from faking their own nuclear weapons. Negotiations may also provide an opportunity for nations to cooperate on how the nuclear hoax is implemented in an incremental, escalating, apparently tit-for-tat manner. For the USSR and the United States, there ceased to be any need for continuing to fake nuclear tests once the nuclear myth had been well established. However, they would both continue to fake nuclear tests and to expand their fictional nuclear arsenals in a contrived game of one-upmanship. Periodical bilateral talks would help to convince the world that each side was continuing to arm itself ever more and provide a plausible explanation for why it never led to nuclear war. The potential for a functioning Soviet ABM poses new challenges to ICBM warhead design. The outcome of this research 
is the cluster warhead. Whilst the arguments over ABMs continued, American scientists were preparing a countermeasure. Multiple, independently targeted re-entry vehicles, MIRVs for short. One single missile could now carry ten separate warheads, each capable of destroying a city. Once you got into the MIRV era, the problem of strategic defense became infinitely more complicated, infinitely more expensive, because you had to devise ways of going after a multiplicity of warheads and uh, uh, all kinds of junk. Over the next 10 years, the Soviet ICBM force would grow to near 1,500 fictional nuclear-tipped missiles. By comparison, the U.S. force rose to over 1,000 ICBMs, with over twice as many fictional warheads. On October 1st, 1975, the Minuteman ICBM force was briefly shielded from a Soviet first strike by a missile defense known as Safeguard. Developed at a cost of over $20 billion, Safeguard was the United States' only deployment of an ABM system. Convinced that Safeguard's radar could be blinded in a nuclear attack, Congress votes to deactivate the site the very next day. Money well spent. Beyond projecting power, profit is the primary driving force behind the nuclear weapons myth. It has acted as a protection racket, fleecing taxpayers for protection against a threat that does not exist, providing the industrial military complex with never-ending blank checks for improvement and replacement and for decommissioning of an entirely fake deterrent. By 1969, the superpowers were, between them, spending more than $50 million a day on nuclear armaments they agreed to meet in Helsinki to try to halt the arms race. The negotiations came to be known as SALT. The SALT stands for Strategic Arms Limitations Talks. Negotiations dragged on throughout 1970 and 1971. In May 1972, after almost three years of negotiations, President Nixon arrived in Moscow to sign the SALT agreements with Premier Brezhnev. ABMs had now been discredited, and the two sides agreed to limit them. But all they could agree on offensive weapons was a temporary freeze on missile launchers. Their failure to control MIRVs meant that in the next decade, Russia and America would add 12,000 nuclear warheads to their arsenals. Through this film we have seen some very poor, clearly fake footage of so-called nuclear weapons. However, America and Russia are not the worst culprits. Their fake nuclear weapons are relatively convincing in comparison to that of the Chinese. However, the prize for the most laudable footage goes to the British. All the tests were air bursts. This meant that the bombs were exploded at 8,000 feet. At that height, there was thought to be little or no danger of contamination with radioactive fallout. I think we had to turn our collars up. Um, we were told 
to cover our eyes. Minus 40 seconds, close eyes, close eyes. We were to put our heads down on our chest, cover our, head, our eyes with our hands. Some of us even use the berries and caps to cover them. Minus 30. On the loudspeakers, we heard the, the run-up to the drop. The, uh, the controller then did a countdown. Seven, six, five, four, three, two. And then at a zero, we felt this almighty. somebody passing a five bar electric fire very close to your back and then moving it away. It was so unexpected and, and, and so eerie in a way because there's no sound whatsoever. There's just this brilliant flash. Although you have your sunglasses on and your hands covering your eyes, you could see all the bones in your hand. It, it, that bright showing through. We didn't wait for the order to be given to turn round, we just turned round and we saw this fantastic orange black flame mass just rising in the sky and it was enormous, pure inferno. We'd seen others, but this was the biggest we'd seen. It was almost beautiful, in fact I think it would be described as being beautiful and it rose very rapidly in the air. We were about 20 miles away, I think, and we got a really magnificent view of this thing. Unfortunately, the gurus forgot to admit or tell us um, about the blast. I think one was aware of a, a steadily enlarging ripple in the sky. This must have been something to do with the blast, but of course it didn't ever occur to us that this is what it was until afterwards. We were stood there gazing at this cloud and then all of a sudden there was the loudest bang you have ever heard. And then there was a sort of stunned silence. Gosh, that was loud type of thing. This time, everything had worked to plan. In the primary stage, lasting 70 millionths of a second, the atomic trigger had exploded. A huge flux of x-rays then poured out, causing the secondary reaction, the fusion of hydrogen, and the release of vast amounts of energy. Within a second, the bomb had erupted into the morning sky as a fireball more than a mile across. At last, this was the successful H-bomb test that the government had craved. On the 18th of May 1974, the Indians faked their first nuclear bomb. It was an underground test and could easily be achieved using large amounts of regular explosives. They claimed to have conducted five more tests in 1998 three on the 11th of May, followed by another two, two days later on the 13th. Only 17 days later, the Chari Mountains of Balochistan saw the predictable but tragic sequel to India's tests. As Pakistan set off its own nuclear devices, the mountain shook and turned white from the blast. Inevitably, the public would begin to wonder why there never has been a nuclear war and no cities destroyed by nuclear explosion as an act of terrorism or as is more likely a self-inflicted false flag attack. Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev signed a far-reaching agreement. For the first time an entire category of nuclear weapons was to be abolished. In front of the world's cameras, the Americans destroyed their cruise and Pershing missiles. The Soviets dismantled their SS-20s. 
In another milestone in reducing Cold War tension, inspection teams from both sides supervised the destruction. In December 1991, the Soviet Union came to an end. And in that year, the so-called Cold War between Moscow and Washington that began at the end of World War II underwent a historic transformation with the Stark Treaty. For the first time in history, the two superpowers agreed that year to significantly reduce nuclear weapons that could reach each other's soil. START, or the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, was signed on July 31, 1991. Under its terms, both nations agreed to each have no more than 6,000 deployed nuclear warheads and only 1,600 delivery vehicles. Just as easily as they manufactured the hoax, they will dismantle it again. The Americans and the Russians have both in their START treaty agreed to destroy a third of their fictional nuclear arsenals. Will they one day proclaim themselves as heroes for ridding the planet of this mythical technological terror of their own creation? Will they replace the nuke myth with space-based weapons and like gods control the world with extreme weather and earthquakes, or at least pretend to? Or will one day the population of the world shed the illusion of fear which until now has controlled them? A virgin of Wellow production.